bat, and they just swing a home run right there. And uh, man, you did such an incredible job uh, today with communion. Uh, thank you so much. We love you a lot. And uh, you know, prayfully uh, this evening, a man is going to be fruitful. Amen. So what what a way to leave Metro Heights region than to leave some fruit behind. Amen. Uh, with the lean man, the just came for our throats. Came for our throats with that contribution right there. He said, man, like keeping your oath to build the sanctuary of the Lord. What an honor. What a privilege it is to build the house of God. You know, I hope you're fired up in your faith this morning. I hope that you're deep in love with the Lord this morning. Because it is that heart that the Lord needs from each and every one of us. You know, I, when I get up here and preach, I'm so grateful. I always thank God for giving me the, the opportunity to talk to his people. Because you guys are the sons and daughters of his kingdom. And that means that you are the apple of God's eye. And I hope you feel valued this morning. I hope you feel loved. And I hope you feel encouraged. Let's pray before we begin. Father, we come before you just so grateful and thankful for all that you're doing. God, thank you for opening up our hearts wide to your gospel, to be able to receive it, to make the decision to make Jesus Lord of our lives. God, we pray for protection. We pray for those and that, that aren't here right now, Father, that, that couldn't make it, that may even be struggling. We pray that you encourage them, that you lift up their spirits, that, that you remind them who you are and how powerful you are. God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to have this building to worship you, to glorify you. I pray, Lord, that today we can leave here just ready to fight for your glory, that we can leave here ready to fight for all the things that you've called us to fight for. God, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I don't know if you've seen this movie. Um, it's a really great movie. And uh, it came out in the year 2000, and it, it was known as The Patriot. Yeah. And you know, th th even though in the, the Patriot, a lot of the history behind it was very accurate, but the character in it was fictional. But I believe that in this movie, there are so many spiritual concepts. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's about a fictional character named Benjamin Martin, a.k.a. Mel Gibson, who was a veteran of the French-Indian War. And it's interesting because the movie, it opens up where, you know, Mel Gibson is with his family. Of, I think he had like seven kids. Um, he's trying to live a peaceful life. And, and little does he know that living a peaceful life was not going to happen during the time of the American Revolution. And as he tries to, you know, farm and build his life, he tries to be a pacifist where I'm just going to be neutral. I'm not going to take no sides. I just want to live at peace with my family. But it's interesting because one of his oldest sons ends up sneaking away to go enlist in the army to fight in it. And little does, does Mel Gibson know that his son would come running back to the house. And as his son comes running back to the
Ephesians chapter 6. Oh, there it is. Oh, Holy Spirit. God said, you ain't loud enough. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. Let's pick it up in verse 10. It says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. You know, our Paul right here, he warns the church to stay strong in the Lord. Now, it's interesting because he starts off and he says, finally. Finally what? Well, finally, after he describes all the things in the previous chapters of what he wanted God's people to hear. You know, in chapter 1, God talks about God's plan. In chapter 2, God talks about how to be reconciled with God. And then in chapter 3, he talks about reveal, the revealing of God's mercy in the, in the mystery of Christ. And in chapter 4, he talks about how to live according to God's glory. But then in chapter 5, he says, he talks of how to live in the spirit. And then lastly, in chapter 6, he talks about walking in the light and fighting against darkness. So he says, finally, after describing all of those things, this is what I need you to understand. And he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. You know, I think this morning we need a reality check of what war we're in. That we are in a spiritual battle. And that the devil is always warring against God's ideals. That, that Satan is, is always looking for a way to separate God's church from the creator. And I hope this morning that you understand that your very relationship with Christ is under siege. Woo! That your very existence and where you're going to go for eternity is under siege by the devil. But Paul says two essential things. He says, be strong in the Lord and put on the armor of God. You know, the, what Paul literally meant right here was that he wanted them to strengthen themselves in the Lord. You see, you can't put armor on when you're weak. Have you ever seen, like, someone that's just so weak that they're sickly and, and they try to put armor on them? Do you think they're going to be effective in the war? Not at all. So we understand that we cannot put on this armor if you're weak. So if you feel weak this morning, the call is to get strengthened by the Lord. Yeah. And so today's title of my lesson is Armed and Ready. You see, we're, we're in a spiritual battle. And because we're in a spiritual battle, you got to be ready. You got to be armed. You got to be ready to fight. You got to be ready to take on any challenge that the devil throws at you. But in order for you to be armed and ready, you must first know your enemy. Point number one, know your enemy. You know, I don't know if you heard of this book. Uh, it's called The Art of War. And it was written around the, the fourth and fifth century. And uh, I want to read you this little passage uh, by the author. He says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. I got to ask you this morning, do you know your enemy? Wow, come on, bro. Do you know what is against you? Do you know that the devil is known to be Lucifer? an angel of light, a roaring lion, a tempter, a dragon, ruler of this world. Do you know who Satan is this morning? Or do you think that Satan wants nothing to do with you and that he is so preoccupied with so many other things that you're not even important? You know, I believe that in the church, we fail to realize the battle that we're in. And because we fail to realize what battle that we're in, we get a little lackadaisical. We get a little slothful. We, we start to lose conviction because we have forgotten what we're up against. Let's carry on to verse 12. It is for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You know, this passage right here, this verse tells us that we're not to fight against each other. 
that our fight isn't against humans, but it's against the devil, his demons, and against the principalities that dwell within the heavenly realms. You see, we're in a spiritual battle. That means that you can't see it physically. And, and because sometimes we can't see things physically, we think they're not there. But Paul describes to the Ephesus church that there are things that you do not see, but because you do not see them does not mean that they don't exist. The unseen is very real. But we also get, get an understanding of what the, the dark forces use. They use flesh and blood. So at times when you think you're at war with people, you're actually at war with the dark principalities of this world. You know, Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 2 talks about how Satan works in those who are disobedient. That's why he says this, the battle is not between flesh and blood, but against those dark forces. But we also learn something that Satan likes to mess with God's people. We know that, right? But we also know that Satan also plays in religion in so many ways yeah. in this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 and 15 says that Satan's servants actually masquerade as servants of righteousness. So we understand, okay, this is how Satan will try to attack you. He will try to attack you through religion and through people. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Because I want us to know what we're up against this morning. Because I believe once you know what you're up against, you have no excuses of being where you're at spiritually this morning. In Revelation chapter 12, let's pick it up in verse 9. It says, the great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan who leads the whole world astray. Let's stop right there. Let's, let's just sit on this part. The Bible says that Satan was hurled down and that he is an ancient serpent and that he leads the whole world astray. So in order to know your enemy, you must know your, your enemy's weapons. You got to know what weapon your enemy is going to use against you so that way you can have the proper weapon to fight against him. What is the weapon that Satan uses the most? Deception. He says he leads the whole world astray. You know, spiritual deception is one of the most insidious weapons that Satan uses against us. And, and, and it's something that he uses and, and he's worked masterfully with to, 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 to keep the church where he wants the church to be. If, if you can get the church believing something false, if you can get the people in the church to fight and bicker and grumble and be disunified, guess what? Satan will always win the battle if you are not aware of his deception. You know, there was a famous uh, preacher by the name of Lamel Haynes, and, and I want to read you this because this I think this is what really exemplifies what Satan is doing at this very moment. He says, Satan is very, a very successful preacher. He draws a great number after him. No preacher can command hearers like him. He mixes truth with error in order to make it go well or to carry his point. He draws a great number after him. He is a very, very laborious, unwearied preacher. He has been in the ministry almost 6,000 years, and yet his zeal has not in the least abated. Wow. See, Satan's been in the ministry over 6,000 years. You think Satan knows a little something about deception? Yeah. And when I think of Satan, and I'm like, man, this, this, this being has been around for ages. And how dare we think that we can just sit there and do absolutely nothing well, this guy is just working on you as we speak. And you are so deceived and not even understanding what spiritual battle that you're in. Let me, let, me, let me tell you how effective Satan is at deceiving the world. Imagine you do nothing about mathematics, right? But if you had 100 years to study out math, you think you would be pretty good at it? Most definitely. What if you labored for about a thousand years to learn all the different types of philosophies, all the theories in the world? 
Don't you think you would be excellent at it? Yeah. But hold up. What if you had 10,000 years to study out every language known to man? You think you would be an expert? Most definitely. And yet Satan has had multiple millennia to study and master the human disciplines that we have on this earth. Are you aware of that this morning? Do you see how deadly Satan is? You know, one of the favorite hideouts of Satan is religion. Man, Satan, I mean, when you look at from the beginning of time and you study out religion and you see how it's morphed and how it's changed and, and how twisted it has become, you begin to see that Satan hides in religion. Satan also hides in, in intellectualism. We live in a time of intellectualism where we think that we're so smart. He, Satan knows our pride. He knows our arrogance. And yet he, he, he gets into the intellect of things to where you think so hard and so deep that you think, I have figured it out. I am the most smartest person on this earth. But then you forget, no, you're not. Satan is. Satan hides in psychology and human understanding. See, that's why we need the word of God. We need a word of God because when these fake philosophies and, and, and these, these false doctrines creep up into the church or into your life, you can deal with it with the word of God. Amen. Amen. You know, Satan can twist the scriptures. We know that when Jesus was in the desert, Satan went out there and he said, okay, let me, let me, let me do some work on Jesus. He tells Jesus all these things and, and, and all these promises. And Jesus, because he knew the word of God, he saw right through the deception. You know why a lot of us are deceived this morning? Because you're just not in the Bible. You are just not in the word of God. And therefore, you are easily deceived by every wind of teaching. You know, let's look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now we have come, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. You know, what is the second greatest weapon that Satan uses? Discouragement. The Bible says that he is the accuser, that he goes to God, and he's like, you know what? God, you know, your humble servant, your humble servant, Gerardo, you know what he, you know what he did last week? He says he loves you. He says he gave up everything for you. But yet, this is what he did last week. God, just, just don't put no hedge of protection around him. He doesn't need it. Let, let, me, get, let me get some of that. Let me get in his life a little bit. Let me, let, me, let me razzle him up a little bit right there. And what Satan tries to do, even to us, is that he tries to play a game called psychological warfare. Yeah. You see, when you take it in your relationship with God, Satan is right there. He's right there with his minions whispering doubt. He's whispering discouragement that you can't do this. You think you can stay faithful for the rest of your life in God's kingdom? I don't think so. Look what you did. Come on. This this. God saved you. You're pitiful. You, you, you are nothing. What, what, have you, what, what achievements do you have to show for your relationship with God? Just fall away. You see, Satan will try to rob your faith, rob your hope, and he constantly is shooting arrows at each and every one of us. He's shooting those arrows of doubt. He's shooting those arrows of accusation. Come on. And he accuses us of our sin. You know, the other thing that Satan uses, the other weapon, is division. You know, Satan's really good at causing a fuss and stirring up trouble and conflict. He's really good at, at trying to separate you from your own relationship with God. You know, he tries to separate the church. He tries to get into your marriage. He tries to cause friction between each other. He just wants a foothold. Because if Satan can get that foothold, he's in. He's about to cause some chaos. He's about to cause some destruction. And I believe that as a congregation, we need to know our enemy. 
that we need to know the, the, the weapons that he uses so that we can grab the right weapons that God has given us to fight against the principalities of this world. You know, it goes on in, uh, in verse 11. It says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Satan is on a mission. And, 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 and I'm not trying to give Satan any, any power than he already has, because God has power over everything. Amen? But you need to know what you're up against. And Satan, you, let, me, let me just put this out there. Satan is not omnipresent, nor is he omnipotent like our God. So guess what? Satan can only pick on one of you at a time. Right. Now, if Satan isn't here right now, guess who is? His demons, his principalities, the dark forces of this world. See, Satan, Satan is masterful. He has a ranking in his army. So Satan can delegate, say, go there, go here, go to this country, stir up this drama, make this person fall away, do this and do this. And we have to understand that's all Satan's doing, but that he is using his puppets, the demons. Because the Bible shows that Satan took over a third of the angels in heaven. That's a lot of angels. But you need to understand what you are up against. And if his, his demons, his, his subjects are going out into the world right now and causing all this destruction, if they are that committed, how much committed should we be as disciples of Jesus Christ? How committed should we be to evangelizing the world in this generation? How committed should we be to stop Satan from assaulting God's kingdom and his people? Turn, turn with me back to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm not going to be up here too long, Amen. We got to be out of here by 12 o'clock. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6, point number two, use your God-given weaponry. Use your God-given weaponry. You know, though we must be sober about Satan and his schemes, we also must take full confidence in what the cross has done to Satan. Amen. The cross has finished it. The Bible already says that, man, Satan is ticked off. Why? Because his time is short. He has, he has no power or authority over God and his plans. But now we're going to look at, okay, how does God want us to fight? How does God want us to approach this war? And what weapons does God give us to do so? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. It says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. So, if you know what the armor of God is, guess what? You can stand firm. You can, you can stand with assurance knowing that you are ready to fight. But he goes on, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, because the day of evil will come, amen, yep. you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. You know, right here, Paul really illustrates that all you have to do is stand. Paul doesn't say jump around, twirl around, slice and dice. He just says apply these, this weaponry to your life and stand firm, which means that if you apply the weaponry to your life, you're going to be unmovable. It's going to be like a force field that when Satan throws all these things at you, you're just standing there just with your shield up and just holding firm, and you're just, you're just hearing this, boom, 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 and it's just deflecting off of you. And you're able to stand firm in the armor of God because Satan's going to try to throw his best at you. Satan's going to try to hurt you by, by your best friend falling away. He's going to try to hurt you. By, by leadership, he's going to try to hurt you in all of these areas that he knows you're weak in and that you're easily hurt by, and he's going to use it against you to turn you against God. 
You see, but the thing about a weapon is that you can have a weapon, but choose not to use it. You can have the, the, the biggest weapon. You can have a big old bazooka, but if you don't pick it up and use it in battle, guess what? You're going to get lit up. Some of us be like, nah, that's too big for me. I can't pick that up. You, that's the only thing you got. You better use it. You see, God has given us a unique kind of armor because we're facing a unique kind of enemy. You know, the schemes of Satan, they can't come near the power of God. And yet the Bible in verse 12 says to put on the full armor. So Paul doesn't say put just this on or that on. He says the full armor. Some of us leave our houses with pieces of the armor. Some of us leave our houses thinking like, okay, I'm good. I, I, got my, I got my little shield right here, my arm shield. I just got to do this and I'm good. You're going to get blasted. Because Satan has worked already and planned his scheme that, hey, when, he, when that person walks out the door, I'm ready for him. I got my arrows ready. Have you seen that movie 300? Yeah. And you see Leonidas at the end of the movie where all those arrows, like, I mean, it was like probably a million arrows coming down and it just like blackened the sun. And, and everyone just boom, 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 just took arrows to the dome, to the chest, like everything. Everybody was just done. That's what Satan is trying to do to each and every one of us. You come out not prepared and not having the armor of God on, guess what? You're going to be dropped dead on the floor because you were just stuck by the arrows of Satan. Let's look at verse 13. Through 17. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So the first the first piece of armor that Paul talks about is to pit the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now, this is interesting because the buckle of truth, you know, it, it, it was to, to secure everything, your garments and all that was going to be there so that it wouldn't get out of whack. So that after you put on the, the, the bout of truth, then you're going to be able to actually put on the full armor right. and keep everything together. But we have to understand that the bout of truth is the truth that foils Satan's schemes. See, that, that's what's awesome about having the word of God, having the truth. Because when you have the truth, you have everything that you need to, to dismantle all the evil schemes that God has against you or that Satan has against you in the church. You know, we stand, we got to stand in the grace. We got to stand in the truth of grace. We got to stand in the truth of courage and strength and in faith. But, I, but when I think of just standing in the truth of God, I think of, man, you, you got to be prepared in your quiet times. Some of us, I dare say, walk out the house and go to work without reading your Bible, without praying to God, without getting prepared. And you know why that happens? It's because you're not taking the war that you're in seriously. Wow. See, that's why some of us are just in a habit of just waking up and just like, oop, throwing all my clothes and I'm out to go. I got to go to work. Oh, sorry, God. And then at work, you just going through it. People making you struggle. You dealing with bad clients. You not spiritual. And God and, and Satan's right there saying, "Yep, see, see, you see, wicked." Wow. Look, he just cussed out this person. See, you died for this person. You died for this disciple. The importance of being spiritual is gonna come from your word that you get in every single day. You can't afford to miss your quiet times. Yeah. That is truth. That, that right there is going to bind everything that you need for the day. But, you know, sometimes what we try to do with truth, too, is we treat truth like a candy apple. And we're like, what do you, what do you mean treat it like a candy apple? Well, you know, when you have a regular apple, it's nutritious, right? But when you start getting that, that apple and you dip it in that saturated caramel with all that sugar, guess what? It ain't lost its value. <laughs> It has lost its nutritional value. And some of us try to twist the word of God to, to what we want it to be. And we, and we try to make it, you know, so soft. And we, and we just dab the truth 
and we saturate it with what we want to saturate, and then we take a bite and think we're ready to go to war. You know, it also talks about in verse 14, the breastplate of righteousness. You see, the breastplate was there to protect all major organs. So that if you did get shot by an arrow or, or someone tried to stab you, you were protected. You were, you were good to go. But some of us don't put on the breastplate of righteousness. Some of us don't want to deny ourselves. Some of us walk out and, and just think, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uphold my own righteousness without the power of God. But the word says, hey, you only will stand with the power of God once you've been strengthened by the power of God. Satan tries to ruin your holiness. He tries to get in there. He tries to, to, to make you sin because he's not going to make you do nothing you don't want to do. But when you do it, it's because you wanted to do it. And you, you said, hey, you know what? I can do this by myself. I can deny myself. I don't need to get open. I don't need to pray. I don't need to read my word of God. And I should be good to go. And some of us are surprised when we're so discouraged and we're so, you know, just, just down by our sin. But you, you have yet to put on the armor and you've let, you've let Satan infiltrate your holiness with God. You know, verse 15, it goes on and it says, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You know, I love this because I, being a track athlete, I had to have, you know, my, my track spikes and track spikes, they have spikes, amen, because when you're on the dirt or you're on that track, you need some grip so that you can get off. And it's interesting because with the, the feet of readiness, what that, that comes with it is the gospel of peace. Well, what does that show us? That one way that you can attack Satan and assault the gates of hell is to spread the gospel. Wow. Is that once you, you just like, boom, you're out. You're out the door like, who I'm going to get today? Who I'm going to share my faith with? Who can to study the Bible? Who wants to get baptized? Who wants to be a disciple of Jesus? And you're out there just running, fitted with those shoes. You know, it's interesting because the, uh, one of the Jewish historians by Josephus, he describes the, the, the soldiers at this time of Julius Caesar's army. They had these shoes that were thickly studded with sharp nails. So in battle, that meant that you were going to be able to brace yourself or you can just beeline to somebody and chop them down and so we understand that you got to have grip with the gospel when you truly understand the gospel and the good news and and what it does guess what what you can do now you can run juke satan because you got the grip because i don't know about you but i can't juke somebody if i don't got no grip have you ever tried to juke somebody when you try to you playing tag how many of y'all play tag don't don't act me y'all didn't play tag you know, if you, I, there's been times I ran on the grass trying to like, what well, about the get him? And then I just slipped. And then I got tagged. And I'm like, oh, because I had, my shoes had no grip. Some of us run outside thinking like, oh, yeah, saying I'm about to, I'm about to get you. And you over here trying to juke saying, and he's like, boom, boom, boom. And you on the floor busted and damaged. Because you just didn't have the grip with the readiness that the gospel provides, which is peace. You know, people want peace. Don't forget that. People want peace. You wanted peace, right? And because you wanted peace, you became a disciple of Jesus. But don't forget that you're in a war. You know, Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. See, the Bible says you're going to have beautiful feet if you bring good news to people. Praise God. Come on, brothers. Come on, brother. That's good news for the brothers. Amen. Who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. We got any, we got any beautiful feet in the house? Oh, amen. Come on. We got some beautiful feet in the house. Y'all ready this week to go out and share the gospel of peace with somebody? You know, verse 16, it says, in addition to all of this. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know, this shield that Paul describes would have been a shield that would have covered your whole body. So it wasn't like one of those small shields like you see the Vikings with at times. It, this was a shield that covered everything so that when, when you were trying to assault somebody and they had arrows and maybe they had a higher ground level, they couldn't get you because the arrows would go right through the shield. 
And so right here, a shield is described as what? Faith. Take up your shield of faith. You see, if you lose faith, guess what? Your shield disappears. Your your shield is no more, and you are now vulnerable to attack from Satan. But you know what's interesting about the shield is that you're not always going to be able to see where your enemy's coming from. Because, again, Satan is, is conniving. He's clever. Yeah. You might think, like, oh, he's coming right here, but he's right behind you. Yeah. The Bible says that Satan is a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I don't know how much you know about lions, but lions like to stalk. Yeah. Yeah. And if a lion likes to stalk, that means that that lion could come up right behind you and just bite you on the neck. But... When you can't see anything because you don't know where it is, you got to trust God. You got to have faith knowing that God is going to protect you because of your faith. So that's what your faith does. Your faith is a shield because you're relying on God to protect you in the midst of the battle. You know, a a scripture that's really dear to my heart that I memorized growing up as a young child because, you know, there were certain things that I was afraid of and I had some weird spiritual experiences and some dark things happened that I I used to go to this this scripture because it gave me so much comfort. It said in Psalm 91, verse 3 to 6, it says, Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. And his faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. This passage shows that if you believe in the one who is faithful to you, you will be secure. And it's time to pick up our shields of faith. Amen. Amen. Verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The helmet of salvation protects your mind of discouragement. It, it It protects you by letting you know that you are safe and that you are saved. When you know that you're saved, that brings a confidence to your relationship with God. But if you take off that helmet of salvation and you're constantly in fear of like, am I saved? Am I not saved? Guess what? You're going to be susceptible to Satan's attacks. But then it goes on and says, not only take up the the helmet of salvation, but the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So now we get to use the word of God as a sword. See, now you got your weapon right there. Now Now you can go and just slice and dice But you can have this sword, but if you never practice your swordsmanship, that sword is useless. You know how many people have Bibles next to their bed but know nothing about the Bible? People treat the Bible as a holy relic. Like if it's the, I used to do this, to be honest. I used to sleep with the Bible, like, underneath my pillow. I'm I'm, I'm being honest. Like, I used to sleep with the Bible under my pillow as a teen because I was just afraid of what I was going through. And I was like, man, only, only the Bible can protect me. I thought it was going to just, like, open up and just, you know, just keep all the wicked things away from me, all the demonic forces that were attacking me. And we have to understand that we got to practice. You got to practice your thrust. You got to practice your technique with your swordsmanship. You got to know how to block the arrows. You got to know how to, where, where that right spot is to just, just, just bam, Satan, bam. You need to know how to, how to really just get them, just sock it to them. Because in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, it talks about correctly handling the word of truth. How many of us know how to handle the word of God? How many know how to use the scriptures to help someone to come to God? How many of us know how to use the scriptures to help that person's heart that's struggling, that needs encouragement? Or how, how do, you, do you know how to use the word of God to rebuke and correct and to train in righteousness? If you don't feel confident that you know your Bible, you need to start practicing on your swordsmanship. You know, let's finish out in verse 18 through 20. It says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of praise and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. 
You know, when you don't pray, it's because you're overconfident in your own abilities. You know, Paul, he says, pray in the spirit on all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. So Paul makes it clear that prayer is, gonna, is another weapon that we can use to, to protect each other. I pray for my people and I say, God, put a hedge of protection around them. God, put some angels camped around them to deliver them from all hurt, harm, and evil. Do you pray like that for the church? Do you pray like that for the movement? Do you pray like that for the people in your ministry? And if you don't, it's because you're overconfident and prideful and arrogant to think that Satan is just going to leave your family alone. He's trying to hurt God. And how dare us not use the weapons necessary to make sure that Satan does not try to hurt our God. Let's close out in Romans chapter 8. You guys feel equipped this morning? You guys ready to fight Satan? In Romans chapter 8, verse 37, Paul says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in our creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says we are more than conquerors. That that if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, that there should be nothing that separates you. No matter what Satan does to you, maybe you might be injured right now. Maybe Satan has thrown an arrow at your thigh and you're limping at this very moment. It's okay, you got some backup. Jesus Christ. Hey, come on. But guess what? You also have each other. Yeah. To pick each other up in the midst of the battle. I want to finish off with this other illustration um, of this movie that I like. It's called Private Ryan. It's, I love war movies. You know, if, you, if you didn't know, I love war movies. Um, you know, but in, in Saving Private Ryan, there was a young soldier. There was a battle scene going on. There was a young soldier standing by a wall And around the corner was his friend who was about to be killed by a man with a knife. And and this this young man, as he's around the corner, he's he's like crying. He's shaking because he's he's so afraid. But yet he has this automatic weapon fully loaded. And all he had to do was go around the corner and just light this guy up, light up the enemy. But because he was so afraid, he didn't do it, and his friend died because of it. May we not have the armor of God, but fail to use it so that the enemy doesn't cause any more casualties. May we not be fully armed and fully prepared for Satan's schemes, to not be armed and ready for the battle that we have entered when you said Jesus was Lord. Because if we do not take this serious, family, there's going to be many more casualties in the kingdom of God. And I don't know about you, but I vow to fight for God and his kingdom. And I believe that if we equipped ourselves, if we get prepared, if we get armed, if we get ready and we apply the armor of God, Satan will not prevail in in this kingdom. And to God be the glory.